Welcome, Sarah. It's so good to be with you here in this conversation. Um, for everybody who doesn't know Sarah, uh, this is Sarah Birch, and she is a climate change coach, actually a combination of things, which I'm going to explain in a minute. Your, your title doesn't exactly uh, uh, you know, resume itself to something neat and simple, so I'm going to explain yeah. that in a minute, but let's say ch climate change coach for the easy introduction uh, in South Africa. And uh, I'm so happy to be having this exploratory discussion with you uh, on health, personality, climate change, soft skills, all of this and where this intersects. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited about what we're going to discuss today. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's, been, <laughs> it's been fun exploring with you so far. So I'm excited yeah. to see what, we'll, what uh, territory we'll cover today. Um, so for the listeners who don't know of your work already, I'm going to give a brief overview and then uh, I have some questions that we'll start to explore from there. So you got your start in your career by getting a master's in conservation biology, right? That's right. Yeah. And long then time you, ago. <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> it's like so long. long ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you spent 15 years, more or less, in, in government and um, doing, uh, like, coaching, basically, for government officials on climate change policy, right? Yeah, yeah, in a way. Um, so working on the climate policy interface, so trying to see how we could bring climate change science into the government space and um, kind of just bring everyone on board um, the same understanding around what's happening with climate change and how we need to prepare. Yeah. 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 And we'll be talking a little bit after about how that experience was and how ready people were or were not. Um, yeah. So what shifted for you then after these years in this role was a personal health event. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. and we'll be talking about that because uh, that was something that really was compelling about your story. Um, a lot of us have had health issues related to processing what's going on with the climate, almost like having health issues along with the earth, you know, in parallel. And uh, a lot of us have had sort of a climate wake up or, you know, some sort of ecological awakening related to our health. So this is a really powerful part of your story and something that I'll be asking a little bit more about afterward but so it was your health event having children and then seeing the dire state of things that really sort of woke you up to a need to for a big lifestyle change and career yeah. change in a way right yeah so kind of seeking tools to that like, retool myself um build my own resilience and yeah I think just work in the world in a different way so finding Kind of tapping more into my skills and passions and trying to see how I could make a difference in a different way. So uh, things have shifted a bit for me over the last few years. Um, a bit, and, yeah. Yeah, so, but I'm still finding my feet. I'm still finding that, that right mix for me. So it's yeah. still a process of evolution, I guess, yeah. Yeah, which is a, also a powerful part of your story. And I think people will hear it throughout the series of these conversations that all of us who are stepping into leadership in, in this are still finding our own feet. Like, mm. I think a lot of people think, oh, well, you already processed everything and uh, you're just, you know, just thinking leadership wise every day. And it's like, no, no, there's still a, there's still this, this whole process for any of us, I think, that are involved in it. Even people who have been involved way longer than you or me. Yeah. 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 I mean, we can talk about that. Hey? Yeah, we are. <laughs> because, yeah. yeah, because even your story, I mean, you were involved in climate change work mm. for basically your whole career. Um, and yeah. yet, you know, you're still finding your, yeah. But I think that has a lot to do with this. Um, you know, you said like when we talked before, you said that you kind of were emotionally not so tuned into what was really going on. And, um, on your website, when you're talking about your story, you know, you talk about this period of despair, denial, trauma, and it kind of puts you into this career crisis. Like I cannot continue, like kind of having this awakening to what's really going on and how that affects you emotionally. It was like, okay, I have to, I have to do this differently. I cannot keep doing this the same way. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, um, 
I think, you know, many, and I'm not saying all, but many individuals who, like me, have been working on climate change from a kind of a science space or like a policy space, um, also who've had a, a training, a background in science, you kind of come in and we don't talk about our emotions in that work arena. We don't talk about kind of the social and emotional side of everything that's happening in the world. Um, so it's almost like put away at a distance or like hidden, hidden somewhere inside of us. Or we go and individually talk to our therapists about it and find ways to cope, hopefully healthy ways, but not always. And I think for me, part of the past four or five years for me has been this awakening to kind of an emotional intelligence around climate change and my own personal like awakening of my emotional intelligence and understanding what I'm actually processing and going through. And so my my kind of transition or my need to transition, I think was also just a way for me to try and like break out and unfold what was happening inside. Um, and so the coaching work that I've engaged in in my own training as a coach and um, working on my health issues has really helped me to, to actually do that and become, I think, more resilient, more able to cope in the world. I'm certainly not saying that I, you know, perfectly happy <laughs> all the time. I still go up and down like everyone else who wobble. Um, but much, much better at, at knowing my limits and what what is for me to do in the world um, and not necessarily taking the whole weight of the world's problems on my shoulders, which I think is also often what happens. We, we, we fall into a space of despair and think that there's so much that needs to be done, it's overwhelming. But if you can get into a space where you can feel comfortable that you know what is in front of you that you can do, you feel much more empowered to actually move forward um, and feel good about what you're doing. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. just a few little insights from the lead into the conversation there. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's so interesting because, I mean, one of the things that, one of the main things about your profile that I think stands out uh, in a lot of ways is that you come from the sciencey background, that you were, um, you know, not into the soft skills so much in, in yeah. your earlier life. So like for any listeners who are like, what is, what are soft skills? I have, you know, a list here just of some of the basics. So I'm going to read them just to provide context mm -hmm. for everybody that's listening. They're like, what are soft skills? So emotional intelligence communication and interpersonal skills, teamwork skills, respect, flexibility and creativity, problem solving and critical thinking, leadership skills, time management skills, organizational skills, motivation, work ethic, and I always add to the list, a basic healthy self-awareness. So mm. we'll be talking about a little later, we'll talk about like personality types and how that plays into mm. all of this. But you know, there's personality yeah. types, there's um, different cognitive profiles there's different uh, I mean cultural backgrounds and everything else so it's kind of the awareness of of yourself in all of these cross sections and yeah. then knowing how to apply them and, and what to do with it and how to nurture the best in it yeah absolutely no that was great I like that list thanks that was helpful yeah. for me too <laughs> <laughs> I know so me, I looked it up because you know I work with this stuff all the time my whole career has been dedicated to self-development and yet at the same time when people ask for a succinct list I'm always like well, there's a lot, you know, a lot involved. So I thought, okay, I will write down a list and, and so that we can have it for reference. So we all know we're talking the same language mm. um, in that sense. But I mean, you moving from that, you know, the science -y side to more to the soft skills side. I mean, soft skills obviously are based on some, I mean, there is some science to it as well, yeah. but the idea is like going from facts and trying to, you know, change the, for example, change policy through facts. It's a very different experience than changing policy through, I guess feelings like in, in a way are fact, like if I feel sad, it's a fact, <laughs> you know, but I mean, changing things through the emotional side of, uh, of, of life and this more interpersonal side rather than 
um, mm. just talking about the amount of, you know, the number of degrees that uh, th that the earth is warming, or I don't know, the percentage of air quality problems that, you know, that are increasing in the world or whatever, it really is a shift. So what was the, what was that experience like for you to shift from the more science side of things, like also interpersonally, like in your relationships, your, your, um, your collaborations and your professional relationships, and then shifting over to this, what was, what was that like? Was there like a lot of tension or how would you describe that experience or that, that shift? I guess that's a process that's still unfolding for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think a lot of those soft skills that you mentioned definitely, I definitely had a lot of those before, but I think the big shift for me is, is, is actually trying to understand where others are coming from. So um, yeah, like we, we, we're gonna to touch on personality typing, but understanding that you know, everybody has these different ways of seeing the world, first of all, um, and that that's okay and that's actually amazing. And that if we can understand more about that of each other, that we can actually relate better to each other like in a workplace or just kind of more generally in our communities on a global scale so you know understanding more about that I guess it's a bit more about the psychology of of humans um has been really beneficial for me not only for myself to understand myself better but to understand relating to others better and I think what's also been really helpful is um yeah, understanding that we kind of want to tap into each other's value systems and really see where each other are coming from. Like you said, you can't just present, you know, a, a deck of science and data and expect everybody to change. We have to actually walk these journeys together. And, you know, I think in many parts of the world, the science, the climate science is shifting to do that. So using storytelling, using kind of co-creation of narratives and visions of the future, and that everybody has equal knowledge and kind of coming together much more collaboratively around how we solve the problems of the world. So I think things are shifting quite rapidly, which is exciting. Um, I wouldn't say everywhere, but you know, some of the folks that I've been exposed to that I work with are really bringing the social sciences and the physical sciences together. Um, yeah, so, so for me, um, also just understanding more about how we can um, tap into those who are in leadership positions and inspire them to support this global shift, this global change in consciousness that we, we wanna see. I, I mean, I'm still learning in that myself, but I think that that's also been hugely beneficial just in my ability to kind of do the work that I have been doing, which is more in the, in the climate policy space, but then also just with, you know, working with individuals that I'm coaching and yeah, so it's still unfolding. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It plays a lot into the personality types question. So I'll jump there uh, mm. now. It's like one of the one of the main reasons that I've used personality typing as a coach uh, and psychologist is that um, it really helps people to understand each other and, and where each other are coming from, as you're saying. Yeah. So, you know, if you're somebody that's highly intuitive, um, then, you know, you might have some communication problems with somebody who's highly sensing oriented using the mm. Myers-Briggs um mm. as a as, as an example and i mean you know on a daily basis when i was really active with coaching uh i would have clients saying oh my god i wish i would have known this you know from from the time i was young and i i felt the same way yeah. i mean when i learned this when, when i was training as a psychologist i thought oh i wish somebody would have told me this a long time ago i would have not wasted my breath a lot of times where i was trying to convince somebody that you mm. know the creative way was was the better way or something like this when for them it, the creative way was never going to be the better way because that's not how they see things um so in preparation for our discussion i got down you know the proverbial rabbit hole um looking into research around personality typing and the propensity for um, pro-social excuse me pro-environmental 
or climate change positive behaviors. And there's actually, you know, quite a lot about it at this point, um, okay. which is really cool to see. So uh, it was really fascinating to see that there are some types that are, yeah, just generally more engaged in these kinds of questions than other types. And I guess to a degree that shouldn't be surprising, but um, but it was interesting to see, you know, which qualities stand out as being um, more putting a person in a in a situation in a in a yeah personality formation that's just going to be more likely to engage in these things and and make positive change. Um, and in the research, they're talking about you know policy making and how policy making should look at personality typing and should look at who you know what groups um, and what. Like you take, I don't know, let's say you take a CEO of a company like BlackRock or somebody that's, you know, having a huge impact. And then you can look at what their personality probably is and then you start making policy around that. So like if somebody mm -hmm. is already naturally very engaged, well, then you um, provide the kind of nurturing warmth in policymaking that, you know, encourages them to keep doing what they're doing. And if you have somebody that uh, is not engaged and that, you know, wants to let's, it protect their assets, even if it kills the climate, um, then you make policies that are more like about regulatory questions than, you know, than this kind of emotional thing. And so you kind of find this way that people engage or don't engage, and then you work policy around that. And I was thinking, yes, I, <laughs> I wish like I could have been saying this, you know, to, to governments 20 years ago, but uh, I wasn't working in any sort of policy domain in any way, uh, but I think it's really interesting insight. That's yeah, it's really fascinating, and I think um, that just says to me again that we need so many different types of people involved in the climate change movement. Yeah. You know, we need to understand each other better and how we can like motivate each other towards this huge changes that we need to see ahead of us in the next 10, 10 years alone, never, never mind like beyond that. So um, bringing psychologists on board and social scientists and, you know, people with different skill sets that can all kind of muck in and get involved. It's like now is the time we need it. Um, but yeah, I think those insights are really quite fascinating. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to think about that in my work going forward as well. Um, yeah, I wish I also, like you said, when we started that, I, I wish that I knew more about my personality typing years ago. It would have really, really made so much of a difference. Um, and since I kind of discovered my personality types and like a little bit more about, you know, what happens when I'm at my best and what happens when I'm at my worst and how I can kind of shift out of those. Um, I just wish that everybody else knew about them too. Um, yeah. Kind of really empowering. Um, so I'm a, an adaptive peacemaker in the on the en 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 enneagram yeah. um, spectrum. No surprise. Um, which has really helped me understand. Okay, I'm this person that kind of wants to <laughs> see everybody's um, perspective, but not necessarily always make a firm decision because. Yeah. you know that can be uncomfortable for me so now I know more about like my strengths and then sometimes where I can struggle and that's really been amazing. Speaking of the Enneagram in my research I found a really cool article where they gave uh, like for each you know for each number so for those of you who don't know the Enneagram there's nine types and um, and so each number has its own kind of style and uh, strengths and, and challenges. Um, and so this article gives for each number, uh, it, it gives like the best way to get involved in climate work and ecological engagement. It's really cool. I'll link it to the, yeah. to, to, the to our um, post here after to our awesome. conversation. Uh, I'll also link a bunch of other things because if anybody wants to go down this rabbit hole with me, it's quite an interesting one. Um, yeah, I mean, it was really cool to see because each, each type, yeah, does have its own strengths to bring to it. And with each type, they also gave a warning. So like, you know, be careful not to, uh, like I'm the type five. So, you know, be careful not to lose heart when you're organizing everything because, um, you know, you might be very ambitious and, and 
organized, but it can be really tiring on the emotions. So please be careful to take care of your emotions, you know, and it's, it's good. It's good to be able to look at it that way. Yeah. I think also in communication, I mean, this is one of those things like now that you know your types, when you communicate with clients and when you communicate with, um, with the government, like you can bring that in and knowing who you're talking to and tuning into their values. Like one thing that we had talked about in preparing for this conversation was like, I was asking you, you know, with the population that I mainly serve, the, the intellectually gifted population, um, I was asking you like, what, you know, what would your tips be for this population? And you were talking about really tuning for each um, I should say, for this population in terms of climate, uh, climate, you know, processing climate grief and getting engaged in a conscious way. And you were saying um, it's really important for each person to, to tune into their own values and then get creative about how they respond to their own values. And I think it's really powerful because a lot of, I mean, we all come into this question of climate engagement with our own backgrounds. So for a lot of gifted people, for example, there was pressure on on us to um, you know fix all the problems you know and and so there can be like a lot of denial like I just it's too big of a problem I can't look at it and feeling this pressure and instead when a person can really not bypass all of that but like channel all of that into looking at like where is their skin in the game where are their values and how can they um, how can they engage their creativity to match their values to the external situation? Then something magical starts to happen. So, I mean, I talk about that because that's the, you know, that's the population, the main population I serve, but for everybody, like knowing what their values are and knowing like what makes them tick. Like for me, the personality typing is really about like, what are you most authentically drawn to every day? Is it creating? Is it sensing? You know, is it logic based stuff, planning and making decisions? Um, or is it the other one, which I'm forgetting? Oh, the feelings, you know, is it just kind of, you know, being aware of your feelings and is that like your dominant thing? And then, you know, working with the situation, like the external situation in a way that makes sense for that, th those preferences, like understanding that about yourself and then understanding your values through that and then using your creativity to help you engage in that way. And also, I think, I mean, for people who would be maybe in denial or, you know, just kind of not really not wanting to engage, at least it could be a way for people in their life to know how to communicate with them. You know, like if I'm engaging with somebody who's, you know, totally disconnected, if I know their personality type, that can help me to know just in the same way as the policymaking, it can help me, you know, to know how to, how to address them and how to tune into what they value. Uh, in some of the research, it was like, so if people are only worried about their own bottom line, you know, like their salary or something, then you start talking to them about how this is gonna affect their salary. And you don't talk to them about how like, you know, the polar bears are, are dying because there's no ice or I don't know, um, you know, two meters of sea rise or whatever. You, you just don't, like they're gonna just not, it's not gonna engage them at all. So I yeah. think there's a lot to be done with the personality typing. Absolutely. I think what you were touching on at the end there, um, links to kind of what I was thinking about when you were talking is that when when we start talking to individuals you know nobody is not touched by climate change in some way and nobody I don't think I think there are very few people who don't care let's put it that way I think most people actually care it's just about how it's framed and how you connect it to their lives um everybody's got something at stake like everybody does and I think if you can really put your feet in their shoes understand like what is their life about what's important to them um what do they hope what what is their vision for the future what yeah what makes them tick you know what what do they love to do what what you know gets them excited and um, if they have children, you know, what, what are their hopes for their children? And there's a story for everyone. And I think that um, it's really about connecting and having those conversations that are really important. And I think for the community that you work with a lot as well, um, that I think what's really critical in all of this and what I've been learning is that community is key and this idea of collective care which also comes comes through with the good grief network that I work with mm -hmm. is that 
no one person should feel like the weight of the, of the world is on their shoulders. So for, for folks who are um, you know, gifted, who are in this world with a lot, um, who could um, you know, really help a lot in solving various crises, whether they're scientific or social or whatever they might be, that those individuals should feel part of a connected community that they can almost fall back on and say, okay, well, it's not all on me, like we're doing this together and that we can allow each other to rest and recuperate and um, still be in this world in a way that recharges us and brings us joy whilst we are tackling like humanity's biggest challenge um, ahead of us. So yeah, those were just a few thoughts that like bubbled up while you were while you were yeah. talking. Yeah. It's so important, and this is something you talk about throughout your work um, about the community aspect and making sure that you're like cultivating that and being plugged in, which speaks back to the soft skills again, because you mm -hmm. need some emotional intelligence to do that. You need good yeah. communication and interpersonal skills. You need a teamwork perspective, you know, in order mm -hmm. to really be able to rely on the community and for. Um, and, and I could go down the list and say why all, pretty much all of them are required for knowing how to plug mm -hmm. into community. And I think uh, something that, you know, I've seen a lot of people struggle with, um, and I've been through some similar struggles at times in my life where I don't have adequate skills d developed to be able to feel like I can just relax and rely on the people around. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for people who have been through trauma, any sort of, you know, developmental trauma or um, interpersonal trauma, it can be really, really difficult for them. So yeah. for, I, you know, I, I've seen a lot of people who are like, you can feel they're, they've got the fire in them to engage, but they've been really hurt. And so in order to engage, they need that community sustenance, but they're, mm -hmm. they're feeling really isolated and unable to do that kind of, you know, connection uh, and, and feel that kind of trust. So for yeah. some people, it's like, you say, you say you need community and collective care and they, they, there's part of them that's like, yes, yes, I want it. But there's another fragment that's like, absolutely not, that's not safe. So for some people, it's even starting almost like earlier in the process. And it's like, you know, kind of slowing way down and going back toward like some basic healing in order to be able to re-engage. And in those cases, I mean, I think it's challenging for people because they think I, I need to be out there and doing something or I need to be like, mm -hmm. you know, fully engaging. And sometimes you just have to heal the wound before you go and try to yeah. lift, you know, a hundred pounds or whatever, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I completely resonate with that. It sounds like you're talking like a little bit of my story because, yeah, I think I, I'm one of those people that has always struggled to ask for help. Um, probably also from like childhood trauma, et cetera, really self-reliant, um, mm -hmm. rely on myself always. Like, and, you know, continuously have that thing where if someone lets me down, it just kind of proves I must, I must hold myself up. So I've had a lot of learning around that, but I, I took a hiatus like that where I kind of, I stood back, I like, I went into myself and did, my own healing and that's kind of was through the year of, of training to be a health coach where you kind of get trained through it yourself coach through it so it was like all this self-exploration of how to look after myself and how to um yeah develop more skills around you know just myself and it was like a year of going inward deeply and that, that's continued um continue to do that work and I don't think if, if I hadn't have gone through that like cocooning almost to like come out in this metamorphosized kind of yeah. <laughs> way, <laughs> now I'm a butterfly, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I wouldn't necessarily have felt able to to reach out into these kind of group spaces and it, it would have been quite challenging for me. So I, I completely get what you're saying. Um, I think also in some ways, the world we're living in at the moment, it might be easier for some folks to actually reach out, um, maybe less intimidating to do it through like a virtual space, mm -hmm. kind of get a little bit of a, a feel for what, you know, what it's like to actually, you know, be part of those kinds of communities. And, and then you can like build up the confidence to 
to do it in person. So I think there's also this window of different ways of exploring that these days, which is kind of exciting in a way. Technologies yeah. both, you know, both got challenges and things about it I don't like, but there's also a lot that's been really helpful to us in society. So yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think one of the things is like being able to find therapists or coaches or whoever around the world, like anybody mm-hmm. around the world could work with you. Um, yeah. And, you know, that or, or with me. And that's like, a, I mean, that's really great that and, and I, you know, I have worked with people all around the world as well for my own, mm-hmm. you know, for support for me. And that's really great to know that you can find kind of the right person for you, like with the right fit, because yeah. many times, you know, you might have, I don't know, depending on where you live, maybe you have 10 or 20 options locally, and they might not, none of them may be the right fit for you. And like, there's nothing wrong with you that those particular people don't happen to be the right fit for supporting you, but you know, so it opens Mm -hmm. up, but yeah, then of course there's the other side, as you said, there's the, there's the scary side of online life as well, which um, can worsen some people's trauma because of the, because of the violence, honestly, that, that comes from, you know, Mm -hmm. online anonymity and stuff. So I think it's a delicate balance Mm and, um, there's a lot of good yeah. work being done around that and you know figuring out policies mm-hmm. that can hopefully minimize the the, the negative side and, and then maximize like the pro-social side yeah online yeah. lives okay so that leads me then to want to ask about the health situation that you had and how that kind of like what was what role did that play in slowing you down and was that I mean now that you've had time to analyze it and it, you know look back on it um was that linked to this kind of self you know fierce self-reliance do you think I don't know it's hard to say um I do I do think there's this very strong connection between biophysical health you know impact and our emotional state and um, but you know what happened to me was I had a pulmonary embolism, which is blood clots on the lung, which can be fatal and quite often is. And it was you know about two weeks after the birth of my first child, so it was extremely traumatic, um, crazy experience to have. And you know basically the doctors told me I was one of the lucky ones to actually be alive. So. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a, a massive moment in my life, and it would be in anyone. So, I mean, I think I was probably in a state of kind of post-traumatic stress, uh, like disorder, depression, all sorts of stuff going on for probably about a year or so after that. Um, mm-hmm. um, but in survival mode, because I was a new mom, I had a baby. You just kind of get on with life and I was just so grateful to actually be alive you know so I kind of marinated in that in that gratitude for like being where I was um so yeah perhaps it was linked in some way to some kind of yeah I don't know could could be linked to to my emotional state and you know the way that I grew up you know, past traumas and not actually resolving them, not working on them, not doing, not doing the inner work. Um, And so it forced me to reflect on my life. What was I doing? What's important? I'm here. I'm here. And that is amazing. What do I want to do with my life? And, and I, that that was a huge event that started me to say well I wasn't 100% happy in what I was doing it was feeling like uh, too much and and I wanted to shift somehow in my life and I knew that I'd always been interested in health um you know kind of just through often researching about health issues. And my mom was in a, in a she was a health protect practitioner. She was a physiotherapist. So, you know, maybe it percolated through her. I don't know, but I, I kind of delved down this route to go, okay, well, I want to do something around health. And then the idea was maybe I could do something around coaching. And, and so my kind of little life story started weaving onto this different, direction um yeah so it's 
it's something that I I do go back to and reflect on. You know, that moment was like this turning point, and it's it's a reminder to go back to. And, and so it's easy to kind of forget those life lessons. You know, it's like four years later. Do I remember what those lessons were? Am I still carrying them with me to kind of stay true to to what I want to do in the world and um, how I want to be, which is actually more important than doing, just being like, um, yeah, so big life lesson. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, again, it's I think it's a really important naming because, I mean, I've worked with so many women who have chronic health issues or mm. sometimes these major things that come up, mm. um, you know, like even life-threatening and, I'm saying women specifically, I mean, you know, it happens to everybody, but women seem to somehow have some more sensitivity or oftentimes seem to show more sensitivity to the things that are going on in the world or um, like traumas carried from childhood about like taking care of everybody mm -hmm. or needing to be self-reliant um, or being the good girl and kind of holding in a lot of the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the rage basically that that comes with, you know, being exploited um yeah. because of your gender and you know all of the cultural things that that many of us already know about um and those of us who are women have maybe lived through in our own versions you know so it's like something that i i just think is like important to name out loud and say that these things can also be linked to this whole climate story like the earth mm -hmm. is you know we're watching it suffer and we're watching it be exploited and I think that, you know, that has a lot of parallels for what a lot of women have lived through, um, whether that's just as children, but probably not, because as much as we were promised in the 90s that like the 90s was the decade of the woman and everything was going to change after that. I mean, you know, we're going into the 2020, uh, 2020s and, you know, frankly, there's still so many issues as we're seeing. I mean, and it's getting better and better, but still there are so many issues. And I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sort of speaking from the West perspective, like there are still cultures that are, you know, keeping women completely like as objects as opposed to, you know, like living autonomous people. So, um, so you know, you have this kind of full, whole context that I think many women are navigating and their bodies are speaking for them. And so I'm like mm -hmm. wondering, I mean, th this happened for me in terms of like, this was a, like health issues were a huge part of my wake up to my need to engage mm -hmm. and my need to defend the earth from exploitation as well. It was like, mm -hmm. there was like this internalized, you know, exploitative dynamic that was like, okay, mm -hmm. I guess it's okay. I guess it's okay. And waking up and realizing, no, it's not okay. It's destroying me and it's destroying the earth. It was like this you know, huge wake up call. And a lot of that is what sort of pushed me to really take a leadership stance on on the question of climate you know i could have just you know like just done my own thing but i was like no nobody deserves to be treated like this the earth not me not the earth nobody um mm -hmm. so i'm curious like have you seen this as well like in clients that you've worked with yeah and i know myself as well i mean on top of the um, pulmonary embolism I have an autoimmune condition as well which I'm not sure if arose after that as a consequence of all the trauma and etc or if it was or it's all intermingled but it's definitely a wake-up call to say well you, you can't exploit yourself you need to you, you know we need to find ways of having people be in the world and work in the world that they can be rested and creative and not be burnt out and you know this whole burnout culture is just like so last century we need to move on um and it's it's reflective of how we are treating the planet as well and and so many of us are getting these kinds of autoimmune conditions and all sorts of different modern day, day ailments and diseases because of of the environment we're creating it's full of toxins and pollutants from like pesticides on our food to everything around us um, and so there's this complete interconnection between climate change, environmental change, and human health and well-being. Um, and I think also it also links to the story about connection. So it's um, people's loss of connection 
with themselves, with each other and with the planet. And if we can be healing and rebuilding those connections, I think that that is really beneficial also you know, when I'm coaching clients, you know, sometimes they have, they've got a sort of some health issues, but there's also this story around con- disconnection and not being able to connect, you know, on a, a variety of levels. So yeah, I, I am seeing it. I am seeing it in the world and in clients and um, just with other people I, I talk with, you know, friends, etc. So it's definitely, there's there's this this trend the story around how it's yeah how it's connected yeah. and, and I true. I think it's empowering when people hear that maybe their health stuff isn't so personal and private because I think uh, a lot of us were trained like if something if you have like a, a health thing then it's personal and private and maybe you're doing something wrong to cause it and mm. um, you know this kind of it, it's it's sort of this private affair. Uh, private suffering and actually when we realize that for a lot of us this is linked to the whole global situation this is linked to Mm. how the earth is being treated this is linked to um, disconnection it's like already you know you can feel this kind of physical shift that like opens up and, and and starts to look around and say oh this is like an interconnected thing this is this is something that's happened not just because of me and my own personal private story um and so I think it it can be this you know illness can be a really great way that we connect with other people I mean obviously mm-hmm. not getting into like super victim mentality and then you know just mm-hmm. commiserating but really like taking the time to process and then uh you know like you say this kind of collective care like putting it in the space of collective care and allowing that to transmute illness to hopefully healing individually but also like to do this big like bigger transformation that gets going that kind of emerges from this this opening uh of ourselves and our situations to what's really going on 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 the whole and why it plugs in on the whole yeah yeah and i mean you know so many i think probably pretty much all of the responses to climate change and environmental change are beneficial to us and our health, you know, if we have organic produce and we have like permaculture and these different ways of growing our food and kind of regenerating the planet while we're doing that, it's it's better for us at the end of the day. Um, It's better for other species as well. Um, And so I think when we start seeing that positive, hopeful aspect as well, in terms of this big shift and change ahead of us, that it's not like, it's not this whole series of we need to sacrifice and give up certain ways of living and certain aspects of our cultures that we are actually gaining so much more. And I think if if we can focus people's attention and minds on what we're gaining, um, I think that's also really important as well. Um, Just thinking out loud, that's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that reminds me of um, what you talked about in, in your uh, podcast interview with Green Leah, uh, which people can find on your website, and we can link to it as well. Um, it, it, you were talking about, you know, tips for people, and one of your tips was gardening. Mm. Start a garden. And I thought, well, we have to talk about that, because that's also one of my main tips for people, because <laughs> of the fact that gardening... Um, really helped me to reconnect with the the regenerative nature of nature in fact um and it helped me to understand oh okay you know you cut here and you look like you're hurting something there but actually it's to help it grow in the better way and you know there's all these things that you do in a garden that are sort of that have their parallels to physical health and well, also emotional health um and that was a really helpful thing for me at but it reminds me as well of what you're talking about. And you said this in, in the interview with Grilea is like that when you're gardening, you're doing it for yourself and, and you and you you gain so much, but you're also giving back. And so it's like this one of these really healthy exercises where it's a connected thing that you really you gain so much from, but yet you're always giving back to the earth. I mean, of course, yeah. if you do if you do gardening <laughs> in a regenerative way. 
naturally. Yeah. I mean, if you're using pesticides and stuff, well, that's not the kind of gardening we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's something that's also really it's within people's reach. So even yeah. if you don't actually have an available garden space, um, if you're living in a small you know, property or an apartment to kind of find places where you could collectively do that as well. Um, and a lot of cities and towns are enabling that to happen these days. Um, it's also a good way to build community and have conversations as well. Um, even if it's you know, a roadside verge, that could create yeah. a conversation as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I derive so much satisfaction just from even just starting simple, like grow a few things, you know, yeah. some lettuce, some spinach, some kale, and it's few tomatoes, like whatever's your favorite thing and just try it. Um, it's so satisfying and um, it's, it just helps to rekindle that daily connection with nature because you have to go out and tend your, tend your plants and check how they're doing and yeah. It definitely creates this back and forward, almost way of communicating. Um, so yeah, it's it's a really good way. I think um, it's it's a handleable way for people to kind of engage in just taking action. Um, yeah. I've just planned out this massive garden, <laughs> vegetable garden for my garden, and we've got veggie boxes being built, and there's going to be apple arches, and it's like this crazy vision that I've got and um, that just makes me really excited. So you can get wildly creative as well, the more you learn yeah. and learn from others as well. So it's also kind of cool. It's <laughs> funny you say that because also personality type, I think plays, plays into how you garden because I'm like the experimenter gardener. I'm like, I've got, you know, peanuts over there, like two, pl two <laughs> peanut plants over there, two wheat stalks over there, like have all of these, you know, things that you don't typically grow in you know, mm. one one or two in a garden, yeah. but I do because I just want to sort of get to know all of these plants and see how they are and how they behave and make friends with them basically, you know, and their energies mm. or whatever. Um, and it's it's such a fun thing, like all of this experimentation. I know not everybody's like that. Some people would say my garden is messy, but it's quite lovely. And it brings so many uh, visitors, you know, like even just, I was ha having lunch outside today and there was this lovely grasshopper. You don't see grasshoppers like anywhere around where mm. we're at. Um, okay. This lovely grasshopper just sitting on the kale, staring at me, enjoying the afternoon sun. And, you enjoying know, nibbling on your kale. <laughs> yeah, nibbling on my kale, but, yeah. you know, he's welcome. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, like, you just have these visitors. And I mean, now we have so many butterflies that come by all the time. And there mm. recently there was um, a hummingbird moth, like, I had never seen one in my life and then you know I make this garden and, and this hummingbird moth comes and visits mm -hmm. and just like learning about these these visitors and sort of having this life passing through is really it's given me a lot so definitely yeah. garden <laughs> if you're listening and you don't have a garden start, <laughs> start a little one at least a little one yeah um you did you you gave several other tips that I thought were fantastic in the uh in the discussion with Green Leia, so I'm going to I'm going to give the list of them, um, and then I wanted to uh, jump over to your work with the Good Grief Network. Okay, so you talked about personal resilience being essential in all of this. So really, I mean, mm -hmm. if we had to say what's the point of developing all the soft skills, well it's basically personal resilience. And that means also relational resilience because if you don't have personal resilience, your relationships aren't gonna do so well. So developing mm -hmm. personal resilience that extends into relational resilience. Um, and you know, you, you really emphasize, and we've kind of mentioned it today, but I think it's worth saying again and again and again, I say it like a broken record in my work, you have to put a lot of time into the process. Like it's not about taking the Myers-Briggs type indicator really quickly, getting your thing, getting your, you know, um, four letter type and then going on about your day. And then you, you know your type, so everything's better. I mean, it takes so much investment into understanding what does that mean for you? Mm -hmm. And like, as an aside, I'll say like with the Myers-Briggs, which is the main one that I've used in my work, um, a lot of people don't even take the test in the way that it should be taken, let's say correctly, in the sense that it's there to measure your personality uh, preferences, not necessarily a fixed type. 
So like, even when I first took it, I took it and I was an ESTJ, which anybody who knows me knows I am not, that's the opposite of my personality. I'm, I'm the opposite, opposite, which is the INFP, but I was just answering how I lived my life. It showed how inauthentically I was living my life at that time. Interesting. Okay. Then yeah. later I retook it thinking, you know, the ESTJ hasn't really worked out that well for me health-wise. Like, yeah, success-wise externally, but in internally and for my body, not at all. Uh, and so I retook it and I said, if I just, you know, if the world was just exactly how I wanted it to be, how would I take this? How would I answer these questions? And then I came out INFP and I thought, well, that explains a lot. <laughs> that explains a lot of the problems that I've had. So I often have people retake the test um, hmm. answering the yeah. questions from the point of view of if this world was ideal for you and everybody supported everything that you did and you wouldn't have any violence or any backlash for you know acting authentically how would you respond to these questions and um then then something more true in terms of preferences comes out um but so a lot of times it takes people really looking at these tests and doing them in a way that's like correct for the test and it measures the right thing and then once you know that you still need to understand what do this preference preferences mean for you how do you apply them like in my case being an EST, ESTJ um, then I had to figure out why have I been doing that like what on earth made me live in a completely inauthentic way to myself uh, well. and that took so many years you know that I, I took like a hiatus like you and it really, I know not everybody can afford to take the hiatus. So it's, I'm not you know, saying, oh, everybody should, but I mean, it does take a lot of time in, into, in, into researching these things and um, really taking the time to learn all these things, you know, like the emotional intelligence, communication skills and everything else. And I think people struggle with that a lot. Mm -hmm. So your uh, advice was, to know that and prioritize it and know that it's a process and it's going to take time. So invest in it you know, like consciously. Mm -hmm. Then you talked about plugging in socially, which we have talked about already here. Um, you also talked about putting in place routines for self-care, which I thought was mm -hmm. really powerful. So like having daily rituals where you're really taking care of yourself and making yeah. sure that your routines are speaking to your actual needs. Mm -hmm. and I think this plays back into the first point, which is putting time into it because if you don't know what your actual authentic needs are and your, your authentic self-care needs, you may be having routines that actually don't meet them and you know don't meet your actual needs. They might meet needs that you think you have, but in the mm. end, you might still find yourself totally burnt out or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to add something to that? No, I think, I mean, it's just something that, you know, I would I'd work with, with clients is just really trying to unpack well you know what what actually works for you because I could suggest you should do yoga but like yoga might not work for you, <laughs> you know? exactly. everybody's different yeah. and also what you need actually changes through your life as well so you also kind of don't want to get stuck in a rigid way of doing things even though for some personality types that might you know be helpful to kind of do the same stuff but over time you might need to shift what your your personal care needs actually are um you might need to upregulate your system you know to like energize it so like going for runs for example doing things that give you more energy might be better whereas um, at other times you might need to just be like slowing down and resting and yeah so it's really like a personal you know, helping people to kind of delve inside and get to know what they actually need is is a it's a big skill I think for most of us to develop because I think in some ways the world has told us to kind of switch off that inner yeah. knowing you know that we must fit into some kind of way of being in the world so yeah that's it's a it's a big thing kind of work on with with the health coaching side of things yeah yeah that's what I was going to say I mean your your specialty is really fantastic for that because you're really working with the central level of needs it's not top down it's not like I have a mental vision that I'm going to be I don't know I'll be able to work 70 hours a week and um, have kids and you know whatever and then I'm going to do that and those are my needs it's like no, no let's look at your energy 
I was look at the kind, you know, like the physical energy you have, let's look at your physical health and then build up mm -hmm. from there. So there's much more of an emergent approach in the way that you work with clients on yeah. understanding needs. Yeah. 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 And just, you know, working with intuition, kind of re like tapping yeah. into intuition. I think that's the word I was looking for intuition. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which plays into the the next um on the list which was creativity like making sure that you're taking time to develop your creativity and intuition mm -hmm. and you know take the time to dream about what what you want in your life um mm -hmm. like you said dream about your perfect fit in the world mm -hmm. i think it's so important like to yeah to have that sense of playfulness and um creativity it's easy to lose that, especially if you're stuck in a kind of, you know, a, a, like a, a cycle of uh, certain types of work and life and kids and, you know, you kind of get into these routines and then sometimes we lose that creative side of life. And I think it's, I think humans are creative, like we are inherently creative. And I think that you know, that's also why scaling back on how much we're overworking ourselves is important and, and so that we're able to let that creativity come out. Um, I think it's just so important in our ability to solve the problems of the world, whether you're talking about the big global problems or could just be small things in your family or your community is to crap, to trap in, no, what's what I'm trying to say, to tap into creativity. Mm -hmm. um, if we can do that, it's it's going to be like foundational in finding different solutions. Otherwise we just keep thinking about the same way of doing things because we're not being able to step back and look at things differently. So yeah, I think even growing a garden taps into that, you know, it totally does. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm the witness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is interesting because when you think about, um, this kind of, you know, very logic, kind of like logic direction, like, okay, I'm gonna make this, uh, I'm gonna have my 70 hour work week and have my kids and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. There, you know, there's a lot of pressure on a lot of us to work like that, um, mm -hmm. you know, and with technology, there's like always a million more emails and you know, there's like mm -hmm. sort of this sort of chaotic routine somehow. It's like a routine of chaos or something. And so finding space for creativity and, um, and playfulness can be really difficult in that. And then the other thing is like, and this speaks back to your plugging in socially question, but in the community care is like, you have to be in a community that where it's safe to be playful and it's safe to be using mm -hmm. your intuition and it's safe to not be overworking. Um, because a lot of people are, you know, if they use their creativity, they're maybe insulted or treated as, you know, as, as lazy, or I don't know, you know, the people who don't value that or who are threatened by um, creativity or something that can happen as well. So that's something to think about too, for a lot of people, mm -hmm. I think that are, you know, wanting yeah. to engage and they want to, they want to put these things in their routine, but they struggle because the people they're connected with don't value those things or actively support them. And then there's something yeah. there to say, okay, well, how about finding other places to plug in where, you know, your creativity is welcome. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. It's, 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 it certainly is challenging in many contexts. Um, and that needs to change. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's not, it's not a great, it's not a great model that we've developed um, for people being in the world and, and being happy. Um, yeah and content so yeah and as like in leadership i found that this is and, and it's one of the reasons that i was so drawn to your approach uh, and and you know the way that you do things is like i have thought well this is this is one thing that i can champion as a leader i can champion spaces where it's safe to be creative and it's safe to be intuitive and it's mm -hmm. safe to be playful um because maybe i mean there are there are lots of leaders doing work in that way and even speaking to these issues specifically but um, you know there are a lot that aren't, and so the more of us that that champion these spaces and and take the time and and use our um, sphere of influence or whatever for you know championing these spaces and growing these spaces, I think it helps. And I think that's something that anybody can do 
in terms of self-leadership and, you know, local, even if they're not doing, you know, sort of more um, organizational or, or, or systemic leadership, I mean, even just within a family or within your local community, you know, there's a lot that you can do individually to champion creativity and playfulness. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, just as you're talking about that, it, it, it makes me think a lot about, you know, raising children in this world. I, I get quite worried because I feel like they need very different skills and, well, not different skills, but we need to focus on different skills for the future. So our schooling model for the last hundred, you know, couple hundred years, I don't think is fit for the world that we in now and it's in many ways I think it hampers creativity and that kind of creative response that we need in the world as well as you know a whole range of other things that that worries me but um trying to kind of fit out against that norm is quite challenging because you don't always have the options available and like how do you go against all those societal norms and try and cultivate th these different models for the future? But we need so many people working on that right now. So mm. you know, it's, it's not even about tackling the imminent crises of climate change and environmental change, but it's like all these societal aspects as well that are interwoven into that. And I guess that's also why we have this whole push towards a just transition and intersectional transition so there's all all of the challenges of our civilization are coming together and they need to all kind of be worked on simultaneously which sounds immensely overwhelming <laughs> to talk and, about but at but the same India time helpful. yeah at the same time if you know if we have so many minds on board tackling all these different parts of the puzzle that we could create a very amazing future which will still be chaotic but you know it could it come with very different very different vision to what we might be seeing in the news which is very like dystopic and um depressing you know so we, we're trying to create cultivate these alternative visions for the world and how do we do that so just bringing in lots of different folks working on different things. I'm not sure where I'm going now. I even remember what the, the topic was when I started talking there, but. <laughs> well, but up. I mean, it, it paints a hopeful picture because I think you're you're pointing to the fact that everybody can get involved. Everybody, like wherever you're, mm. wherever you are, whatever you're doing, like you could get involved in education. You could get, it doesn't always have to be like, okay, I'm going to be the next climate scientist. And this was mm. really important for me in my process of like waking yeah. up and getting engaged. But, uh, Cause I was like, I, you know, I'm, I'm so deep into my work, you know, um, running this organization, Intergifted, and I'm so deep into my psychology work. Like I train therapists, I train coaches. Like I don't, you know, at this point, I have a lot of energy, but I don't think I have enough energy to go like retrain in climate science and then try to do a different job. And I was at an impasse for quite a while with that. Where, like, how can I get engaged in like that? Well, hello after a while it came to me well hello where you're at is really important because people's psychology right now has a lot to do with like wounding and denial and reasons that people are struggling to engage and so then I thought mm. oh well yeah I mean I still trust me I've still had to anybody listening don't worry I've still had to learn plenty um I've read a million books and <laughs> but I've read a lot of books um you know and I've had so many conversations with you with people like you, you yourself and people like you and um, yeah, it's still it's still been a lot of work to figure out how exactly I plug my skills into the current system, but here I am and I'm doing it and I think everybody can, whatever their particular skills and passions are. I think there's like this mm. diagram that maybe it goes around mm. and probably everybody that's done any climate work has seen it, but it's like something like your passions and yeah. skills and um, the situation in the world and then like where you're needed most. And mm. so it's like not mm. saying, you know, yeah, i use your creativity to go and playfulness and 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 everything to go um recreate everything that you're doing well you did you recreated but still you you're in a hybrid where you're still yeah. working with the government and you're still mm -hmm. so it's not a, even for you it's not an, an yeah there's still some overlap it's not like 
you just mm -hmm. jumped ship and then you're doing yeah. something entirely uh in a, an entirely different field so yeah, yeah. I, I think it's powerful yeah yeah i mean i think that is what happened to me i, I sort of thought i i for me personally i thought i needed to go off on a complete tangent but i also recircled back and i was like okay well let me integrate and blend you know yeah. these different skills i have and actually find my way in the world where i can can bring them together and yeah. and then feel good about what i'm doing um yeah. so that's been an important part of my journey as well yeah well and to yeah. speak to to the the question of com the community care i think what's been important for me and i'd be curious your experience on this is that like as i have stepped out into this more you know the center of the venn diagram it's like i'm not leaving psychology entirely but i'm also not only doing it on the personal level mm -hmm. um it's been really like heartening to see that valued from other mm -hmm. people and again it's like this collective care thing like i felt very alone when i was just trying to figure out okay what am i supposed to do kind of this black and white like do i just jump and quit everything that i've been doing and uh, and then when i said okay no i'm gonna kind of go toward the center of this venn diagram and then having people say we really appreciate that you're doing this this really makes a difference you know it was like oh there is a community of care that that I'm plugging into by by showing up this way in the world mm -hmm. by using my uh, services uh, my services and my skills to at the service you know of the situation and um, and also then seeing there like that was for me a huge portal that opened up to me getting to know you and Adam Lerner and all of the many wonderful people that I have spoken with and you know learned from and it's like it's kind of an interesting journey what from like where I was where I was going oh my god like I do I have to change everything and it's, yeah to see how it happened is is really heartening I wonder if it was like that for you too yeah I really liked some of what you said there and just just around, I think that term like showing up in the world it's 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 finding your own path to do that that's really important and I think you know, especially when folks are kind of maybe emerging and to really comprehending the climate crisis and what's at stake, what's in front of us and being overwhelmed or, or kind of going into these states of grief and eco-anxiety and, and whatever might be going on to, it's, it's going to be a process to, to find your feet and figure out what to do. And, and I think what's important is that folks understand that you don't need to crack it. You don't need to have all the answers. You don't need to do all the things all at once and be this like perfect human because that doesn't exist. And to kind of just do what's within your reach and slowly like build, build your community build your understanding of what your passion and skills intersection with the climate crisis is. And it will be a process that will unfold and, and to be patient with that and, and show compassion like, in that journey. And like, so some of the, that unfolding is kind of some of the things that we work on in the Good Grief Network. 10 step processes and there's different types of processes out there kind of working on climate grief and eco anxiety and that's yeah it's 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 a process so it's um I think your question was if that was like if it was like that for me and definitely it's been a process I mean I think it's still to some extent is um but yeah it's been like this journey I didn't quite know where it was gonna land like I had no idea I would land up um facilitating support groups on eco-anxiety and climate grief virtually across the planet yeah and I was not on the radar four years ago <laughs> yeah I mean I don't even hadn't even dreamed of that being a potential thing in my life so yeah. it just goes to show like what what can happen yeah yeah true I had didn't imagine having a series like this at the beginning. It was like, yeah. okay, just try to, you know, apply psychology to this and we'll see. And then, you know, these opportunities open up and 
um, and, and keeping the creative channels open and keeping the intuitive channels open and mm. tuning into the body, all of these things have been really important in the process because the logical mind is like, it's a good tool sometimes, but use in moderation. <laughs> You know, yeah. using a holistic <laughs> ecosystemic approach, yeah. it's fine. It's helpful, yeah. you know, but like sitting there and going, oh, like I have to know, I have to know everything, you know, up front. Mm -hmm. And then, it, then, you know, you, you just get stuck. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to give the, your, well, you had on the, on the, t the list of tips, you also talked about understanding the different personality types, which we have talked about mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we could go on and on on that on that conversation, but that's that's another story. And then um, you talked about uh, practicing meditation and gratitude, and I second that. I think that those are also really important. But now I want to shift um, to talking about your uh, your groups, the Good Grief Network groups that you mm -hmm. facilitate. Um, I printed out as I showed you before before the call. I printed out the, the ten steps, and I wanted to share them. Uh, with everybody. And then I wanted to hear a bit more about your experiences there and what you notice with the people that are participating and what gives you hope, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in participating with these and supporting the people who are participating. Okay, so the Good Grief Network, I guess maybe you should give a little introduction to who they are, who you are, um, sure. and then I'll give the, the 10 steps. Yeah, so <clears throat> I mean, I found, I, I found the Good Grief Network a year and a half ago at the beginning of the pandemic, actually before the pandemic started, um, because I was actually trying to explore how to kind of merge my coaching work and my climate change work. And I was trying to see if there was such a thing as a climate change coach or, you know, I was really trying to bring my skills together. And I, and I, was, I was still feeling um, some grief that I hadn't actually understood was was grief. Mm. Um, so I found a good grief network, just, I, I don't even know how, but it, it was like this really pivotal moment where I found them and I was like, wow, okay, this sounds amazing. I need to do this. So, I mean, I went through my first group myself and it just, it helped me to understand that there was something called climate grief, eco-anxiety, you know, ecological grief, all these different terms that are out there now that we're all feeling that are actually appropriate responses to what's happening in the world. So like, first of all, that's really important to understand it's, it's an appropriate response to a planet in crisis. Um, and, and that there was this beautiful process of working through these emotions. That's kind of like a, a step process similar to like an Alcoholics Anonymous type of a group. So it's kind of based on that kind of an idea. And it's a peer-to-peer -peer support network. So it's not like going to see your psychologist. Um, no one kind of suggests ways to fix or to address what you're bringing up, but you all kind of come to bear witness to each other, to listen appreciatively and to kind of just create that um, safe space where people can come and actually express what they're feeling and it's really amazing to also just hear others and you know not feel alone so I think a lot of people have been feeling alone in emotions around this and so it's amazing to find spaces where you can tap into community for people that understand where you're coming from um, so yeah it's a little mix of explaining the groups as well as a little bit of my experience, but basically um, the founders who developed the program have worked on it for, for a number of years and it's, they have worked so hard at just creating this amazing experience. It's got poetry involved and embodiment and, you know, just this really safe space and this um, very, I think a very smart kind of way of going through some deep conversations about what's going on internally, externally, how to like bridge that gap. And um, yeah, so it's a 10 step process. Should I go through that or? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. If you have yeah. them read, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Just so it starts with accepting the severity of the predicament. So really, you know, especially if maybe if you're new to it, they've really kind of, okay what is actually going on and the predicament is a whole range of 
of the challenges it could be the climate crisis, the ecological crisis, species loss, um, and all the societal challenges intermixed with that as well. So whatever is coming up the most for you, you might delve into that a bit and, and really just kind of sit with it. So not the idea is not to look away, you know, but to actually look head on and not be fearful of doing that. So I think a, a lot of us are, we're trying to kind of just, you know, just look away because it's, it, it's a big thing, it's big. And we have to acknowledge that. Um, and then the second step is practicing being with uncertainty, which is really challenging for humans under any <laughs> circumstance. We don't like uncertainty. Um, and especially if we live in kind of very comfortable Western societies, our lives are pretty certain. And this whole concept of uncertainty and major change is, is also quite unsettling. So kind of just practice being with that. And I think in some ways the pandemic has also talks to a lot of these steps as well. So you could almost apply these steps to the pandemic. So the pandemic has brought up huge amounts of uncertainty for everyone. And it's been challenging to deal with. Honoring my mortality and the mortality of all is step three. So really looking at our relationship with death and that can be quite intimidating. Um, but even just a little window into that is helpful, you know, just like touching into it, getting getting a flavor for like what, what is our relationship with, with mortality. Doing the inner work, so a lot about what we've talked about today, and that's kind of a continuous journey, but it's an important step for folks to often just start delving into if they if they're not in that kind of space. Um, step five is developing awareness of biases and perceptions. So this is also like really important in terms of understanding our own biases and maybe that might be coloring our way of, of um, responding to the world, but also then becoming more empathetic to everybody else's experience and that nobody's perfect and that we also, it also helps in kind of breaking down these polarized views of the world um, mm -hmm. which are becoming extremely harmful in the world right now um, practicing gratitude witnessing beauty and creating connections so you know the joy the juice of life we have to practice that especially if we're feeling low you know we kind of have to cultivate practices to make sure that they're there all the time so that when we do get hit by a pandemic <laughs> or whatever it might be that we we're connected we're able to bounce bounce back up so it's kind of talks to that resilience side of things as well taking breaks and resting I think so foundational and you know people are talking a lot more about this these days but I think we still have a very superficial understanding of what that is. So really taking breaks and resting, like are we really rested um, in our society? Most of us probably aren't. Um, and then step eight is grieving the harm that I have caused. So kind of taking ownership of being part of the process. Like nobody has had a free ride really. I think, yeah, some parts of the world are not kind of, part of that but most of us have had a role and still are even just by virtue of just the fact that we're in a society that we haven't we can't unknit everything right um yeah. you might you still have to drive a car maybe just because of where you live or you know certain things you just you're still part of the system um so to grieve that and, and kind of feel that um and step nine is showing up and it linked back to a comment you made earlier about showing up. So it's showing up for yourself, actually, hmm. firstly, so that you can show up for the rest of the world or for your community or whatever size bubble you want to like think about, whatever's appropriate for you. And then step 10 is reinvesting into meaningful efforts. And again, that is completely individual. Everybody's different. And some folks can't go and do all the crazy things that you know like being involved in um 
big demonstrations or being like really out there because some people are introverts and some people are actually really run down and just can't do it. So reinvesting into meaningful efforts that are meaningful for you and that you can do that also fit into your Venn diagram, you know? So yeah. yeah. So those are the 10 steps and um, the process works on a week, week each, you know, each week you work through one of those steps and then you can obviously cycle back to it and use it as use those tools, you know, moving forward. And some folks come back and do the group again because it's it's like we talked about earlier. It's not something that just clicks. It's it's a process of unfolding um, and and like relearning and yeah, yeah, very powerful. And I mean, I think it when you know when I read the steps and hear you talk about them it's I haven't been through the program myself but it it you know sounds like it really does this kind of magical process of cultivating aliveness this kind of fundamental aliveness that's in a person um and you know given that a lot of your focus is on resilience personal resilience um you know that plays a big part like having resource resources inner resources and and having aliveness allows for that resilience in these moments that are completely uncertain that deal with death that deal with um you know these these harms that we've done like things that are really really you know difficult to deal with that could throw us into really low states of of maybe apathy or depression or um you know shame even or something like that mm-hmm. and cultivating this aliveness is really important because um and and uh, like as you say witness beauty and create connections is kind of also aliveness that's connected to the world outside of us, to the natural world um, mm. and to our social world. And having that available allows us to, I mean, yeah, we might still feel moments of shame or we might still feel moments of apathy or something like that, but it, it sort of feeds the system with enough uh, of this energy that doesn't allow us to get stuck in those, yeah. in those states. So yeah. what gives you the most hope then, you know, like as you're, le- as you've been leading these groups, what is, you know, so I, for me, like to sort of uh, contextualize the question, you know, when I'm working with people, gifted people who are in their self-discovery process um, and they have these like awakenings or, you know, these moments of clarity, what really gives me hope is like one of my contributions I want to make is to really humanize giftedness and just make gifted people understand like they're just human and they have to like take good care of themselves as a holistic being and it's not just about like being a you know fast brain kind of thing um and so really when i see this then i think well i feel better in the world and the the world feels more hopeful for me when i see people with really big minds like you know being fully in in, like embodied and being fully Mm -hmm. in touch with themselves and they're like the wide range of humanity like humanity experiences that that they experience so I'm curious when you're working in these groups what is your kind of thing what is the the hopeful feeling that you get yeah I think I mean I think for me well there's so much to this work actually and I I think also just to mention if folks want to find out more to go to the Good Grief Network website. And also there's a, there's a podcast and Laura yeah. and Amy, who are the founders have spoken extensively. So there's like so much more richness to all of this, but just my experience as, as one of the facilitators of the groups is, I feel like I'm part of like a movement and a network. So for me, I feel, I feel really, I feel empowered just helping others find their own kind of sense of empowerment, whatever that might look like. Um, it helps. It also helps me to feel energized in the other work I do as well. Um, so it kind of does that too. But what gives me hope is that, you know, I think a lot of people who go through these groups um, do go back to whatever they're doing in the world just with different colored lenses on and different perspectives and different maybe different ideas or thoughts about what they're doing in their lives or how they can connect with their community or family or schools universities workplaces whatever it might be and that they will have a ripple effect themselves um 
and yeah I mean I, I think that that's really powerful um and I think you know every single person that um can look at the problems ahead of us kind of head on and really tap into how they're feeling about it and um kind of use those emotions in a positive way is going to be helpful in the world um yeah i mean we need millions of people doing this kind of work in all different ways shapes and forms so there are other similar types of processes and groups doing this kind of work um and that have also been around for many years so we kind of need this massive movement of of spaces like this and I think in some countries we are starting to see that there's like climate cafes and all these different yeah. things popping up where people can actually go and process and talk and create community and um, actually go through all the emotions which will help everybody to actually band together and, and do something um, <clears throat> we don't know what the world will look like but um, we we have to cultivate positive visions and hope and and yeah I think we definitely can't do that if we emotionally shut down and disconnect um, from the world so like I see these processes as fundamental in terms of like the global climate change response it needs this psychological emotional response happening at the same time um, yeah. it's like foundational yeah yeah I mean I'm so grateful for the work you're doing because you're bringing this aliveness to it. Like I said, you know, the creativity, the playfulness and this aliveness, so like what you're doing with the good, the good grief network. And I, I love their work too. I think it's so fantastic. Um, but it's, it's always in, in service of this aliveness, you know, this basic life force and, um, and, and this, you know, creative and emergent life force. And I'm, I feel really grateful to be part of your social network, your professional network, um, to be able to sort of tap into that whenever I'm, you know, interacting with your field. Uh, and it's, it's so powerful. So I can imagine that the people that are you know, in your groups with you and your clients, they're experiencing that as well. And I mean, in terms of role modeling and providing these spaces, like I was talking about champion, championing these spaces that are, you know, these collective care spaces and playful spaces and all of the things that we're talking about today um, in terms of fostering this aliveness, I think your work is, is amazing for that. It's, uh, it's absolutely needed and much appreciated by me and I know so many others when I you know announced that we would be having this call so many people said to me oh she's so wonderful I can't wait to hear your call your your uh, your talk it's going to be so great I can't wait to tune in so you know there's there are many of us out here appreciating what you're doing and just appreciating where you sit in our ecosystem as well uh, in terms of the support so I want to thank you for taking this time uh, to do this whole process with me, the, the the prep and the talk. And I know so many listeners are going to, you know, be hearing this and feel even more alive than when they started listening. Um, so for anybody who wants to check out Sarah's work, you can go to sarahbirch.com. Yeah, sarahbirch.com. Sarah Birch coaching. Coaching.com. Coaching. <laughs> I couldn't remember. <laughs> I have to think about it too. <laughs> I've typed it several times, but you know, then it, now that it has the autofill, so so I, I don't have to think. Yeah. You know. Um. So SarahBirchCoaching.com, and we'll be putting your links for your for your various uh for that and for the Good Grief Network, um, in in the post here, uh, associated with our our talk. So, um, so that's that. But we will. I will leave you the floor now so that you can close with a poem that you have prepared to read for us. Thanks, Jennifer. And also just a huge thank you to you. This was just such a fabulous discussion today and also equally appreciative of the work that you are doing in the world. So keep doing it. We need these conversations happening and these spaces for storytelling like you, like you turned it. I really like that way of talking about it. Yeah, so this poem I'm going to read is, is it's one of the poems that we often read in the Good Grief Network, um, kind of re-engage with poetry through the Good Grief Network, and it's been, it's been really great, actually, to just 
bring that side of life back into my life as well. So you might before you start, this. just let me. I, yeah. I realized I know we're on live, but I just realized that of all the things I prepared, I forgot to plug in my computer. <laughs> it's just about to die. Okay. Okay. Go for it. Yeah. So you might have heard the poem before, but it's the piece of wild things by Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night, the beast sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and I'm free. So beautiful. Mm. It's beautiful. Paul. <laughs> yeah, I think it talks to a lot of what we've talked about today, just yeah. connection and rest and looking after each other and yeah, our connection with nature. Yeah. Mm. Well, for everyone who listened, I hope this was uh, an engaging and insightful talk for you and we'll look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Jennifer. Bye.